Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another Saturday morning where we get to time together and chop it up with a quiet time studying the Word of God. And today we're going to focus on a hidden faith. A, if your faith is hidden, that might not be a good thing. And then B, in the Word, there's aspects of it that are hidden that we need to discover. So today we're just going to go over a few things, kind of emphasize a hidden faith. As always, we start out each week with our mission statement, which is we are a group of people desiring to draw closer to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ through Christ Jesus and empowered by the Holy Spirit. We continue on that path. We've been on that path since August of 2021. Hopefully we have been drawing closer and closer to him. Last week we got really up front and, you know, close and, uh, you know, drawing closer does not mean that it means more and more comfortability. You can be drawing closer and, you know, it gets a little bit uncomfortable because the closer we get to the Lord, the more we see ourselves, how we fall short. And that's not necessarily a comfortable thing for a lot of folks. So I'd say it's better to, you know, get close and get cleaned up in the meantime, find out what it is that he has for us, what he's asking of us, what he's given us, how he's raising us up and what he's raising us up from. It would be more important to know those things than to not know those things and to arrive on that day and we're not prepared to meet our maker. A lot of people don't wanna have those type of conversations because they feel like, well, if I, if I think about that type of stuff or if I have those type of conversations, it's uncomfortable because maybe I'm speaking it into existence and it could be closer than I than I think. I don't want it to be that close, so I don't want to think about it. Well, it doesn't make any sense, and I, but I understand the mindset. The reason why I say it doesn't make any sense is because, you know, in the beginning, which we studied last week, and we've studied back in August, in the beginning, the whole question was, did you certainly die? We even committed a whole study to it. And so death has actually been the Achilles heel of the human being ever since the fall of man. It is actually the one concept. Everything else derives from it as it relates to the fall of man. So this one topic is the topic that was the beginning topic. To deny that topic and to run around the block around that topic for 40 years like the Israelites did in the desert just doesn't make any sense. If I know that's the one thing that's my obstacle, then I wanna know about that obstacle just like I wanna know about a competition in a sporting event. I wanna know about the competition. I wanna know what their tactics are. I wanna know what their tendencies are. I'd rather know this information here of why we gave it up. So if I wanna get it back, I wanna know about that topic. Right. And so it seems to me that it would be more of what the enemy would propose for us to not really understand it and know about it. So we want to draw closer to the father regardless and drawing closer. We look at a scripture every week and today we're going to study out Psalm 82 verses six through eight. I said, you are God's. You are all sons of the Most High, but you will die like mere mortals. You will fall like every other ruler. Rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations are your inheritance. Man, that is so incredible right there. We see the backpack, my man is drawing closer to the Lord, which means that would make you be able to get closer to the Father. But it says here, I said you are gods with a little G and an S. And that would be because you are sons of God. 
And as a result, that makes you little gods. Now, guess what? You have to have faith to accept that. You actually have to have faith because that's something that people believe it means something different than what it means, right? But it's clear here. But he's saying, although this is who you are, you will die like mere mortals. So we know if this concept of death is this enemy, and the scripture says in Revelation, it is the last enemy that shall be destroyed, right? So it's an actual enemy that will be destroyed. And so if that enemy was not in our uh, way, not in our mix, then what would we be? We'd be little gods with a little G and a little S not independent gods in and of ourselves where people need to be coming and worshiping us as individuals. We're just talking about being children of the Father. And as a result, you know, now, well, we die like mere mortals, but that's not really who we are. That's not our real self. And so the flesh passes away, but that inner being, that real self is actually the little God son or daughter of the most high. But because we're in this flesh, because of sin, fallen man, you will fall like every other ruler. So he's going, a ruler has no precedent. So it doesn't really mean, it It doesn't, we don't, God's not saying, I don't care how high you are. I don't care at what level you are on this earth. I don't care how much of a countryside you rule, how much power you have, you will die like every other ruler. And so he's telling you right there, don't go praising men, don't go praising women as a result. But in verse eight, he says, rise up, O God, judge the earth. Okay, so there's been these debates. I see people kind of looking at me when I say Jesus was the one rolling in the garden and Jesus was the one rolling with Moses. And even though I end up showing the scriptures that kind of clarify it, it's still a little bit harder to swallow when traditions have told you that that was not Jesus and Jesus is only Jesus when he came into the flesh as a baby through Mary. And that's the only thing people know about Jesus, even though John 1 completely contradicts that vision, people still roll with that for whatever reason. However, in verse eight here, this is Psalm. This is Old Testament. Well, you tell me, how is God going to rise up if he's already the most high? He's the most high. Where is he rising up from? Jesus is the one who rose up. So who are they talking about? Is this scripture talking about the Father? Rise up, O God, judge the earth, for all the nations are your inheritance. How the nations are gonna be the Father's inheritance? He can't inherit the nations. Who are you gonna inherit the nations from? Scripture is common sense. When you shed traditions or falsehoods and things of that nature and just read the verses for what they say and really pay attention to detail on what they're saying, and seeing does this way I'm thinking, does it make any sense, right? And so you'll have people say, well, rise up, oh God, means it's just, you know, God rising up against the enemy. Okay, then explain your inheritance. Like how God inherited something he created. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's the son. That's why it says, I said, you are gods. You are all sons of the most high. We know we can only be sons of the most high if we're grafted into Jesus Christ, who is the son of the most high, who is the God who rose up and who is the one who inherited all the nations. As he says in Matthew 28, 18 and 20, all nations, right, have been given on to me. So it is clear from Psalm 82, 6 and 8. It is clear from John 1. It is clear from Matthew 28, 18, 20, that Jesus is the one that is running the show. And he is the one that's going to be giving everything back to the Father, who at that point will be in all and over all. So as Jesus says, he and the Father and we 
in Jesus. All right. We start out each week with a prayer. And today we're going to focus on Colossians chapter 4 and verse 12. And it reads, Epaphras, who is one of you and a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. He is always wrestling in prayer for you that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. So we have to mature in Christ Jesus to become more and more fully assured, right? So that insurance has to grow. That means our faith has to grow. That means our understanding of God's love for us has to grow and our love for God has to grow. Our love for his son and the father has to grow. Our learning and understanding of the Holy Spirit that has been given to us must grow, must mature, like a tree must grow and must mature. And so we got our brother Trevor here who's going to open up up with the prayer uh, we greatly appreciate. All right. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you so much for just being able to rise, to have another day, to breathe uh, the air that you provide, Lord. Please clear our minds. Please clear our hearts. Please clear our conscience so that we're able to just take in your word. We're able to meditate on your word and we're able to find out what it is you call us to do, Lord. I thank you so much for everybody that's on the call, whether it's uh, the first time ever being on here, whether they're here every single week, Lord, or whether they just drop by every now and again, Lord. Everybody's here with a heart that wants to know you, a heart that wants to be close to you, Lord. And I just pray that you just fill us up, Lord. Uh, uh, allow us to not be empty vessels. Allow us to be full of your spirit so we can go out and we can impact the world. We can impact our community, Heavenly Father. I thank you so much for Brother Rodney this week after week putting these teams together. I know it takes a lot of work, Lord, and um, I just pray and thank you for his spirit to want to just nurse, nourish the sheep, Heavenly Father. Allow us to uh, take the time to reflect on what we hear, Lord. Take the time to be involved, to really uh, not be here just to listen, but to learn and then to turn around and apply what we hear, Lord. Thank you so much for this morning. Um, uh, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen to the amen. Thank you, Brother Trevor. Greatly appreciate it, bro. All righty. It is time to play the recap game. And I hope you guys are fired up and ready to go. That you've been studying, paying attention, being caught up, paying attention to detail because it will show during the recap game. But that's okay. If we don't get the answer right, we will get the right answer before we leave. And it's all about getting put on point one way or another. As long as we get on point, that is all that matters. So let's go ahead and play the recap game. Question number one, what did the angel say about Eden's restoration? Was it A, in the middle of the garden stood the tree of life? B, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? C, on each side of the river stood the tree of life? Or D, on one side of the river stood the tree of life? What did the angel say about Eden's restoration? Was it A, in the middle of the garden stood the tree of life? Okay, who says it was B, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? All right, who says it was C, on each side of the river stood the tree of life? Yes, sir, I'm going with C. I'm going with C. All righty. And who says D, on one side of the river stood the tree of life? All righty. The correct answer is C, on each side of the river stood the tree of life. 
That's a big deal because back in the Garden of Eden, before the fall, right, in the middle of the garden stood the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. So there was two trees in the middle. But this time in the book of Revelation chapter 22, it said on each side of the river stood the tree of life. That's a big deal. Question number two, what did the angel say to John when he fell down to worship at his feet? Did he say, A, you are well favored and blessed. B, don't do that. C, praises to God for your humility. Or D, all that is left is your financial contribution. What did the angel say to John when he fell down to worship at his feet? Who says that he said, A, you are well favored and blessed? All right. Who says, B, don't do that? Say B. B. All righty. Who says, C, praises to God for your humility? I say C. I'm going to go with C. All right. Who says, D, all that is left is your financial contribution. All right, the correct answer is B. He said, don't do that. <laughs> you know, that kind of, for me, that tells me the angels are kind of cool because you would think that an angel would like have this really profound answer, you know, hey, please don't bow before me. I am the angel. I'm not Jesus. You know what I'm saying? He just don't do that. <laughs> That's pretty hip. All right. Question number three. What can those do that are given the right to the tree of life? Is it A, go through the gates into the city, B, wait for the gates to be opened, C, knock on the city gate, or D, drive their new car around the city to show their friends? What can those do that are given the right to the tree of life? Who says A, go through the gates into the city? I say A. I say A. Yeah, I think, I'm thinking A. All righty. Who yeah. says B, they can wait for the gates to be opened? All right, who says C, they can knock on the city gate? All right, who says D, they can drive their new car around the city to show their friends? All righty, the correct answer is A, they can go through the gates into the city. Wow, because you're gonna have the name of the father on our foreheads. We got that VIP ticket running around with the Holy Spirit that was deposit, that was guaranteeing us the right to get up in that city. And so getting the Holy Spirit and keeping it is of utmost importance. Bonus question number four. Jesus said that he sent his angel to do what? Was it A, listen to your church doctrine, B, Decide if this is the right message for your church. C, gain conviction for your testimony. Or D, give you this testimony for the churches. Who says that Jesus sent his angel to A, listen to your church doctrine? All right, who says B, decide if this is the right message for your church? Alrighty. Who says C, gain conviction for your testimony? Yeah, I'm going to go with C. Alrighty. And who says D, give you this testimony for the churches? I said D. I'm going with D. D. Alrighty. The correct answer is D, give you this testimony for the churches. Come on. So that means all the churches that are claiming to be a church related to Father God, Jesus Christ, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all the heavenly hosts have to have this testimony. Can have a different testimony because this was the testimony for 
all the churches. Incredible. It helps us to understand that truth because it helps keep us on point. And, you know, doesn't mean you might be in the church and it might not be on point with the testimony. Then if you have, if you're on point with the testimony, go help those in your church to get on point with the testimony, right? So whoever has the testimony, make sure that everybody else is on point because the church is not the building. The church are the people that are in the building. The church is not limited to the people in the building because you are a temple. So it's those that are housing the Holy Spirit of the Lord wherever they are. And that testimony, therefore, must be a testimony of the heart. All righty. So y'all got game. Thank you so much for playing the game. Well appreciated. And uh it's always good, it's fun, it's exciting, but it's serious business at the same time. So we can gain a conviction about what is being said. It's not always about the memory as it's about the conviction. And when we have the conviction, the more we are convicted, the more we will not necessarily remember, but the more everything will make common sense to us because it's starting to make spiritual sense. So amen, thank you guys for playing the recap game. All righty, here's the map, and it's the new map that we've come up with for several weeks now. And you see the ledger to the top left, the black is death by disobedience, the blue is saved by faith and grace, the white are the prophets, the red apostles, and the purple are disciples. And to the right, we see that the black is the law. And so we see if the black on the right is the law, and the black on the left is death by disobedience. They work hand in hand. We see the blue is faith, and we see the blue on the left, saved by faith and grace. They work hand in hand, and then you see below that gray, and that's mixture, and you don't see it matching anything on the left. Well, we will describe that here in a second. You see the big heart in the middle, that's God's heart, and everything in the whole universe fits inside of God's heart but you see jesus promptly set there right in the middle he is god's heart and everything derived comes by god's word and jesus is the word of god so we can't say we love jesus and doesn't and we don't love the word doesn't make sense to the left bottom we got adam one and it's in black and why because because of adam ushered in death by disobedience, right? Being disobedient, eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that's what the law is. It's the knowledge of the good and evil. And that's why you can't be saved by it. We see next to Adam, Abraham, Moses, and Joshua, they're all in white. They are prophets. They're not all the prophets. They're just three prophets as it relates to the promise of grace and faith and the law. Abraham received the promise. We see the line in red going from Abraham over to Paul and Peter. Why? Because Paul is the apostle to the Gentiles and Peter the apostle to the Jews. There are more apostles too, but we have focused on those two. And we see that Moses and Joshua are in white with the law above them because Moses ushered in the law. He didn't get to see the promised land and Joshua continued to lead them through, through to the promised land, but still with the law. Between the promise to Abraham and the law that Moses brought forward is 430 years. The New Testament explains that the promise that was given to Abraham could not be set aside by the law. Those were two different covenants. The promised covenant is first. The law covenant was second. The law covenant nobody could fulfill except for Jesus. And since Jesus is the only one to fulfill it, and he is the high priest in the order of Melchizedek, and as high priest, he has the right to bring in the priesthood he wants to bring in. As a result, he brought in the priesthood based on the promise and did away with the requirements of the law because all fall short of it other than him. So only by the law would there be one. 
Jesus, but because he brought in the promise and he used the promise to basically give us faith and grace, we are now deemed righteous by faith. And that's the faith that Abraham had as his faith was credited as righteousness. People say, well, that's gonna give people a license to sin. That's not understanding the power on the works of the Holy Spirit that is supposed to give us a heart of gratitude. And by being grateful, we want to do the right thing. But being in the flesh, we fall short. We saw the bottom prophets in white, disciples in purple, and apostles in red. Above the disciples, we see gray. Above us, we see gray. That's called the mixture. And that should not be there. It should be only the blue, being saved by faith and grace. But disciples then, during Jesus' time, disciples during the early church, and disciples today struggle with the mixture. It is because although we're saved by faith and grace, they're still being held captive by the law, trying to be made righteous by the law. And you can't be made righteous by the law. There's nothing you can do. Your best work are but filthy rags. And as a result of that, one sin, just one, deems you unrighteous, a lawbreaker. So we need faith credited as righteousness. That removes the gray. All righty. Now it's time to dig in. And we're gonna study out today, John chapter 10. We're gonna start it out in verses one through 14, and it's titled, The Good Shepherd and His Sheep. We're reading it out of the NIV, and starting in verse one, it says, with quotes, very truly, I tell you Pharisees, anyone, who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate, but climbs in by some other way, is a thief and a robber. Well, we read last week, we just finished doing the recap game, and we're talking about the gate. And so that gate, right, you have to have that Holy Spirit as a deposit to get in that gate, right? Now, of course, these thieves and robbers can't get in that gate anyway. However, he's basically saying, right, because your purpose of going to a ministry, your purpose of listening to religious talk, your purpose of serving, praying to God and doing all that we do in our gratitude and service to him is that we will get into that gate. We know it's by faith and grace, the faith and grace that was given to Abraham that we must have to enter into that gate. Well, since folks that, are, that don't have that aren't going to enter into the gate, then this is those people who are telling people that if you do it this way, you can get into the gate. And so they were pushing the law. You can't get into the gate by the law. That's climbing in some other way, but it's deceptive because you're not really climbing in. So it's deceiving people to believe that they're climbing in, that they can get into the gate. Well, you're not supposed to be climbing on the gate. You're supposed to be able to walk through the gate, right? The open gate, just go through the gate. But they're trying to climb in the gate. What does that mean? That means the gate closed. So it's not an open gate anymore. And so if we don't read other parts of the Bible where we understand what a gate is and what God said about the gate, then it's going to be hard to necessarily understand it. And though he's using an analogy, right, a, a parable, so to speak, to describe the situation, you need all the other information to really understand what the parable is actually saying. And verse two, it says, the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. So there you go. He didn't climb over. He actually entered the gate. Well, he's the only one who went into the most holy room. He's the only one who have seen the father, right? 
He's the only one who's talked to him directly. And so the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. Verse three says the gatekeeper opens the gate for him. Wow. So the gatekeeper opened the gate for the shepherd. So the father opened the gate for Jesus. Wow. That's heavy, man. The gatekeeper opens the gate for him. And the sheep listen to his voice. His voice. Who? God's voice. The father's voice. Yo, Rodney, that's confusing. What do you mean the father's voice? The father's voice would mean the word of God. He's not just whistling. You can't just hear a whistle and understand what the whistle is saying in any kind of conversation. So if God is speaking, then that's his voice. Then that means it's his words. And Jesus is the word of God. So if you're going to listen to God's voice, it's listening to Jesus Christ. He is God's voice. And he is the one who we listen to as sheep. And that's how we enter in through the gate. So if we're not into God's word, how do we expect to get into the gate? We'll continue. He says he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. But wait a minute now. Lead them out where? If you're going into the gate, aren't you going in? It said the one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. So he's going in. But then it says here he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. So obviously he's leading you out from the goats. He's separating the sheep from the goats. And who is he talking to? Pharisees religious leaders. So that means he's going to be leading sheep away from them, lead them out so they can go into the gate. Verse four, when he has brought out all his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. So he goes ahead of them and brings them what? into the gates and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. What's the voice? The word of God. Verse five, but they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will run away from him because they do not recognize a stranger's voice. So the word of God, when we read it, when we study it, when we get deep into it, by having that Holy Spirit, because you got to understand, it's the spirit of God. So the word of God and the spirit of God connect because the spirit of God recognizes the word of God. It does not recognize a stranger's voice. So when we get caught up with false religion, traditions, all kinds of things that don't match the word of God, that's a stranger's voice. And when we hear the word of God, it's supposed to resonate to us. When we have the Holy Spirit, it fits. Verse six, Jesus used this figure of speech. There you go, figure of speech. He's talking kind of symbolic to him. Jesus used this figure of speech. But the Pharisees did not understand what he was telling them. Isn't that interesting? He's telling them, I'm going to get these sheep away from you guys because y'all are strangers and you're not speaking the words of God. You're just talking some religious garbage. And as a result, I'm taking my sheep away from you. And they're going to come away from you because they recognize that I'm the shepherd. And they still didn't get it. Verse 7. Therefore, Jesus said again, why? Why do you say it again? Because they, they didn't get it. Therefore, Jesus said again, very truly, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. Wow. So wait a minute now. We would have to go back to the beginning, right? The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. So now he's the shepherd of the sheep. 
and he's the gate. It says the gatekeeper opens the gate. So the father is opening the son. So then what's the gate? It's got to be their hearts. It's got to be their hearts. The way to the father is through Jesus's heart. That's incredible. Verse eight, all who have come before me are thieves and robbers. Wow. He said, everybody, all who have come before me are thieves and robbers. I know people, you know, we like to feel good about ourselves and think we're doing something pretty cool and, and that we, we're okay people. We're not that bad. And then Jesus just comes out and says, you know, there's some humility. You know, you guys are a part of fallen mankind. You do know that, right? You do know that when you're born in this planet, you, you have flaws. The, the moment you born, right? You come into this joint with flaws. You do understand that, don't you? And so as a result, you shouldn't be getting all bent out of shape when Jesus comes at you and causes something that technically that's what we are because we're fallen. We fall short of the glory of God. And so when our standard is what's in the world and we standardize things based on the level of the world, then you end up, you know, hey man, look at the Pharisees and well, I'm gonna compare myself to that situation. But then God comes over there and says, look, I'm a I'm hundred thousand zillion percent pure. Like I, none of that, none of them thoughts you guys have, I don't even have those thoughts. Like that, but then you start to realize that to, to him, right? So you're, you're, you're judging me. I'm not judging you. I'm just reading the word. We're talking about the one who's the gate is compared to him. Compared to him, this is who we are. So all who have come before me are thieves and robbers. But the sheep have not listened to them. Well, then why have they been coming? If they haven't been listening to them, why were they showing up? How could the Pharisees be the, it wasn't like the Pharisees had a, a ministry going for five days only. This guy's been rolling for a while. He says, all who come before me, the, the priesthood from Aaron and all of those boys, they had run for a while. You go, well, man, they can't be talking about them. Look here, Moses didn't make it, right? Because he got upset and didn't do everything God said. So he didn't get the role all the way through, but he showed up on the Mount of Transfiguration. Uh, I don't have any doubt that he was, you know, saved by faith and grace, not the law. But, you know, that's the, that's, he was the most humble guy in his time. And Aaron was the priest. And Aaron, when Moses didn't come back for a little bit, Aaron over there with the folks building the golden calf. So, you know, this is at the top of the food chain spiritually at, at, the, at the time. So how could we say that thieves and robbers are not the program, right? What are, we, what are we basing stuff on? If we base it based on the reality of the history of the word, then we can start to see clear more that, you know, the person that's saying this is Jesus Christ. So the sheep have not listened to them. So that means they were just going through rituals. They were just going through it. They weren't really paying a whole lot of attention. They just doing something that they were taught to do by traditions. Because if they were listening, in reality, they would have been able to de uh, determine they weren't saying the right stuff. And then Jesus to come back and say to you know Nicodemus, "Are you Israel's teacher?" Like because you're not making any sense. So when you really pay attention and pay attention to detail and really study this stuff really th thorough and by the power of the Holy Spirit, we can see when stuff doesn't make any sense. And that's my goal on doing these studies. At any rate, let's continue in verse nine. He says, I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. There it is. We have to enter through him. We have to actually go through Jesus Christ, that means through his heart, that means in his love, right? That means when he gave his life for us, so he became like us, so we could become like him. We have to actually enter through him to become like 
him. They will come in and go out and find pasture. Whoa. Go come in and go out and find pasture. Okay. I will save that one for another day, but that's pretty heavy right there. Okay, that's pretty heavy right there. We know the gates, all right? And he going, they're going in and out. I mean, that's some freedom in Christ on mind blow level that you got that those type of abilities. Okay, that's a little bit deep. Verse 10, all right? So the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Wow, all who came before me are thieves and robbers. But the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Well, death came by disobedience, and that was ushered in by the serpent. So therein lies your thief. So he came in to steal, kill, and destroy. Steal man's authority on the earth, Adam and Eve, mankind. That means both man and woman, Adam and Eve. Kill, that was death. That was what was, you not shall not surely die. And destroy, all of a sudden now the earth is producing thorns and thistles and everything else. So this is the M.O. So, you know, like Brother Ben here, one of my buddies here on the call, right? Being an officer, he knows a, a thing or two about the concept of MO. What's the MO? So we now know the MO. That's the MO, steal, kill, and destroy. And so when he says, everybody that came before me with thieves and robbers, he's telling us that this is who we are. We go, no, we're not. He goes, anybody who says, brother, be cursed. Raka is guilty of basically murder. So mentally, right, spiritually, and some points from people physically. Even Moses did that before he got called up, right? Paul was given approval to that before he got called up. So that's who we were, right? So the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the full. You mean to tell me that I could be categorically a person being looked at as a thief and a robber, where my MO is to steal, kill, and destroy, and that Jesus still came to give us life to the full? Jesus came to give us life to the full, and that's who we were categorically? How is it not gratitude that's got to be our motivation rather than the law? It's got to be gratitude. Verse 11, I am the good shepherd. So everybody else before him was thieves and murderers or robbers. In verse 11, now I am the good shepherd. So he's the good shepherd and the game. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. And that is what he did. Verse 12, the hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. Whoa, shepherd and the owner? Okay, he says, you are not your own, right? You are not your own. That means you, you, we do what the owner tell us to do. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. Well, who's a hired hand then? Because he's saying he's the shepherd. You go, no, 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 no. My pastor's my shepherd. Seriously? Seriously. Rodney's my shepherd. Seriously? <laughs> okay. The higher hand is not the shepherd. He's the good shepherd. The higher hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. Right? So this cat's out there getting paid. I'm not down on them. Don't get me twisted. I'm not down on them. I'm just saying they're doing the job that God has given them to do, but they are not the shepherd. If anybody got mad at that, something would be wrong. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. You go, no, no, no. Okay, well, hold on. Peter and the boys, when Jesus got attacked, them cats scattered and they the best of the best. So, you know, very rarely will somebody die for a righteous man, right? Now, if it was a real, really righteous person, because now Jesus is God in the flesh, so, but they still scattered. Now, later on, they got their convictions straight. The Holy Spirit got in them and got real powerful. But, you know, 
Jesus is talking about cats that's categorically thieves and kill and destroy. Like in our in our worst state, in our worst state, he didn't run away from us. In our worst state, he came out to help us and lift us up in our worst state. Not too many people is going to be willing to die for somebody who's just, just jacked up, sinful, not caring, just a wretch. Like, and too many people dying for somebody like that. But Jesus did. It says here, then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Now, who was he talking to again? The Pharisees. So he's telling them, I know who you are. This is who you guys are. You are these types of religious leaders. Are there religious leaders like that today? Yes. Are there religious leaders not like that today? Yes. Are there religious leaders that don't have the capacity to have, that have come from that? Or if they're not being, you know, focused and spiritual and putting the work in, could become, you know, result, result back to that, like a dog returns to his vomit. Yes. So what must I do then? I must realize that I could do the same thing. I'm not so holier than thou that I can't falter two. That's one. And two, I got to be a Berean, right? I got to look out like they examine the scriptures every day to see what Paul said and see if it was true. Well, I got to do that. And you have to do that, right? That's why I don't mind when people question me about stuff. And in verse 14, it says, I'm the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. So who is he? The word of God, the spirit of God. God is the other part, three in one. And as a result, the sheep know the word of God. That's heavy. That's why we try to we try to focus and dig in and not do, you know, just only a drive by quiet time. We we like to, we got to dig in too. Hallelujah. Uh, verse 15 through 26. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. So here now is getting clear. He's using the example just as like just like just as the father knows me and I know the father. And I lay my, down my life for the sheep. Right. The father's not the sheep. And Jesus is not the sheep. He's the shepherd. So we would be the sheep. He says in verse 16, I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. So introduction here of Jew and Gentile, Jew and Gentile, right? So he has other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd, not 50, 100 churches, with 50 other ministers that are not on the same testimony. Everybody's got to be on the same testimony. The angel from Jesus gave the testimony to the churches. This is the program has got to be. And I must bring them also. So if we got called and we got called, then we are called as one of those sheep. And we're being called to one shepherd. And it's not any man's name other than Jesus Christ. They too will listen to my voice, the word of God. And there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. Wait a minute now. Verse 17 says, the reason my father loves me. <laughs> okay, hold on now. He hadn't laid down his life yet on the cross. Obviously, he already knew that that was going to happen. 
And we know it's obviously because as a baby, it was already pronounced by the angels. So he already knew what time it was before the fact. And so by coming to the earth, he had already laid down his life. So he had faith. So the reason my father loves me is because of my faith, is that I lay down my life only to take it up again, which means I have faith beyond death. Whoa, faith beyond death is the answer to the riddle? Death happened in the garden based on not obeying God's command. The law shows us God's commands. We can't fill them. So the garden gives us an opportunity to see if we can do different than Adam and Eve. And we can't. We just like them. So anybody who thought, man, Adam and Eve messed it up for all of us. Really? So if it was if it was me and Jessica, it'd be the same messed up. If it was you and your woman or you and your man, you're the same jacking up, right? It's the same thing. <laughs> Adam and Eve, that's all, that is all of us. We jacking it up the same exact way. He gave us an opportunity and we jacked it up too. So we can't be blaming no Adam and Eve, right? But faith beyond death. Verse 17, I'm saying it over and over because I want you guys to really focus on that. Underline it, listen to the video, study that out. Faith beyond death is the program. Verse 18, no one takes it from me. Isn't that heavy? You're talking about a volunteer. Oh my Lord, he volunteered. Wow, no one takes it from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. Not a hired hand, a volunteer. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. Well, that means he didn't lose his authority after dying on the cross. His authority remained intact. But wait a minute, Rodney, he was separated from the father. He took on the world's sin past, present, and future, he became drenched in all our filth, and yet his authority was not removed. Faith is the authority. This command I received from my father. So faith isn't a command. Verse 19, the Jews who heard these words were again divided. Many of them said, he is demon-possessed, and raving mad, why listen to him? Now tell me, what did he say that was come anywhere near remotely close to being demon possessed? And so what, obviously the people saying that was demon possessed, right? He is demon possessed and raving mad. Why listen to him? Verse 20 on, but others said, these are not the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of the blind? Wow, you mean a demon can't do that? Well, let's look back now. Let's go back now. See, we think these conversations are just happening in that moment. But these conversations are all geared toward the beginning of Genesis in the garden. Because it says, then they realized they were naked. But that was darkness. That wasn't opened eyes. They could not see. The tree of life was taken away. So they couldn't see. So it's something that my dad always says, they can't see for looking. <laughs> I can't see for looking. You, you might have 20-20 eyesight in the world, but can't see spiritually. That's heavy duty. And so a demon can't open the eyes of the blind to see the truth spiritually. Verse 22, then came the festival of dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter. Hey, it's winter now. That's cool. 
And Jesus was in the temple courts walking in Solomon's colonnade. Verse 24. The Jews who were there gathered around him saying, how long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Messiah, tell us plainly. Now, he's been plainly telling them. But if they're not focused on Genesis, they're, they're not focused on uh, uh, the law. They're not focused on the history of the prophets and all. That's why they can't see it plainly. But he's pretty much talking plainly. In verse 25, Jesus answered, I did tell you. Well, there you go. I did tell you, but you do not believe. And so it's hard to understand because of a lack of faith. The works I do in my father's name testify about me. What? The works I do in my father's name testify about me. Well, how come the father's name as a quote unquote name isn't being mentioned nowhere in these passages, but then he's going the works I do in my father's name? Well, he says, I have the authority to lay it down and the authority to take it up again. So the acts, the activity, the actions is the name. Because back in those days, they didn't just give a person a name just based on the name. Hey, I'm going to name this kid uh, Bob just because I like the name Bob. What's the reason for it? I don't know. I just like the name Bob. They didn't do it like that, right? When they named somebody something, it had a meaning to it, right? When God said, name him Jesus because he will save his people from his sins, right? Yeshua means basically the same thing, saving the people from their sins. The works I do in my father's name. So the authority that my father has. If I had a signet ring and I showed up and I got the signet ring of the king and I said, hey, give me the, those four horses over there in your stable. Well, what do you mean give you these four horses in my stable? What name do you come in? You show them the signet ring. Oh, hold on, let me hurry up. I'm proud. sorry, I'm sorry. They go get the horses. So Jesus is going, if I didn't have the authority with the signet ring of the father, the creator of all the universe, I could not do it. My father's name is the name. I am. It is the one. That's my father's name. The high, the most high the higher authority, the ultimate authority, that's my father's name. Any kind of noun or adjective that you can come up with to describe being the top of the top, the one, only one, the most powerful there is, that's his name. Verse 26, but you do not believe because you are not my sheep. And so if people don't believe, you just let it be. They ain't the sheep. You can try to keep trying to help them believe, but they might not be the sheep. Hallelujah. Verse 27 through 42, and we conclude it here. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Now, earlier he says they know him. And now he's saying, I know them. Jesus Christ knows each of us personally. He knew us before we were formed in the womb. So he knows who we really are. We trying to learn who we really are. He's trying to say, you're not that person. That's not who you really are. No, that's the earth person. That's the person where you were born in your family's name and everything else that was around you. That, that, but that's, that's not the actual person. That's not the person I know. That's why he named Abram, changed him to Abraham, right? You know, changing names, Sarai to Sarah. He's changing names. Change uh, Peter's name from Simon to Peter, right? We got a different name. We, we not, not, might not know what it is today, but we, he knows who we really are. And so we follow him, right? We follow the Holy Spirit. So keep in step with the Spirit. Then we follow the word of God. We're on a path. Verse 28, I give them eternal life. Not, uh, wait a minute. It doesn't say that, right? It doesn't say I give them eternal life. It says, I, it says we earn eternal life, right? No, I give them. That's the gift. A gift. 
I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. There's the death concept. There's that death that's plagued mankind since the fall in the Garden of Eden. So if he's going to give us eternal life and they shall never perish. And obviously, like we studied last week in Revelation 22, we got the tree of life. And so we have to have faith in it today. So if you have faith beyond death, then you shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. Nobody has the power, the strength, the magnitude to take us away from Jesus Christ. Verse 29 says, my father who has given them to me. So it's a gift from the father. We're actually God's gift. You know, people say, what do you think you're God's gift to mankind? You go, yeah, well, kind of, <laughs> kind of, right? Because my father who has given them to me is greater than all. So we're a gift from the father to Jesus Christ. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. I and the father are one. So they, we, we can't be snatched out of the father's hand and we can't be snatched out of the son's hand. And so if the words on the scroll were written with a hand, well, it was written with the power of the father's hand. And therefore we have to be in the word. We have to be written in the book. That means we have to see ourselves in the scroll. Verse 31 says, again, his Jewish opponents picked up stones to stone him. They, they not, they're like, this is too deep. I'm not rolling with this. This is no, no, no. This is, this can't be. You over here claiming some stuff that, that shouldn't be claimed. We're, we're just mere men. But Jesus said to them, I have shown you many good works from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any good work, they replied, but for blasphemy. Now, come on, does that make any sense? He says, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. So you're doing the work from the Father. We, we're, not, we're not stoning you for any of that stuff. We're stoning you because although you're doing these works from the Father that we can't deny, what you are saying is crazy. So because of what you're saying, not what you're doing, because of what you're saying is the reason why we're stoning you. Verse 34, Jesus answered them, is it not written in your law? I have said you are gods. Then we study that in the beginning. And wasn't it written in Psalm? And that David had quoted it. And so here it is from King David and the law that it said, you are gods. In verse 35, it says, if you call them gods to whom the word of God came, whoa, and scripture cannot be set aside. That means that in receiving the word of God and being written in a scroll and being considered a child of God, that you are a little God. You're scared to say that, right? Because people don't want to stone us. We didn't say we were God, the most high. We're sons and daughters. Verse 36. What about the one whom the father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? So he goes, the ones who received the word of God was called gods. But what about the one whom the father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Wait a minute now. People going, no, no, no. Jesus Christ wasn't the one from the beginning. He wasn't the one that was running around there. No, 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 no. It's only Jesus when he came into the flesh that he's the son. But that's not what it says in verse 36. He says, what about the one whom the father set apart as his very own? That means before this earth and sent into the world. So he was sent into the world already set apart. Hmm. Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy? Because I said, I am God's son. Then it would be blasphemy for us to say, we're God's sons and daughters because of Jesus Christ. 
That would be blasphemy too then. But verse 37 says, do not believe me unless I do the works of my father. So there is works that we have in us because Christ lives in us. So we're supposed to be doing some stuff, but we're not going to be doing no stuff if we don't have the faith. Because Jesus said he couldn't do much stuff in areas where the people didn't have any faith. So if we don't have the faith to start raising up around this joint and thinking the right way and understanding what God has called us to and the gift that we are and that Jesus Christ died for us and he didn't die for us just because of the craziness that we were into. He died for us because he knew who we really were and who we really are that stronger and above the craziness. He died to save us from the crazy us so that he can introduce us to the powerful us, to the righteous us. So in verse 38, he says, but if I do them, even though you do not believe me, believe the works that you may know and understand that the father is in me and I in the father. So since y'all calling me blasphemous because of the words I'm saying, then just go ahead and roll with me based on the works that I'm doing. And in verse 39, it says, again, they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. So they wasn't, they wasn't hearing it, okay? There's people to this day, they're not gonna hear it. And I, they're not hear what we're saying right here. In verse 40, then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. There he stayed and many people came to him. They said, though John never performed a sign, all that John has said about this man was true. So John the Baptist was powerful as all get out. And the Bible said, but the least in the kingdom of heaven is more powerful than John the Baptist. Now, of course, he's talking about John the Baptist in the flesh. And so that means that we are different folks at a different time with a level that we need to be tapping in to. And in verse 42, it says, and in that place, many believed in Jesus. And so the question is in this place, are we really believing in Jesus? If we believe in Jesus and Christ lives in us, then we have to believe who we really are. And we have to believe what we're really capable of. So the Lion of the tribe of Judah says, we are either reigning as priests or we are not. In 1 Peter 2, 9, he has made us into a royal priesthood. And in Revelation 1, 6, it says that he has made us into kingdom and priest. And we are to serve our God and reign on the earth. So, um, yeah, first of all, Rodney, I appreciate you uh, again uh, putting this together uh, for us and, you know, um, breaking things down um, as God has enabled you to uh, have that talent and skill. Um, one of the things that, that I love about the word of God is, is that he, it always proves itself. It, it states things, but then it always comes back and proves itself through action. Uh, and God makes it evident if we look at uh, the scripture. And one of the things, one of the scriptures you shared with us earlier, um, earlier, uh, and you talked about the MO. Uh, um, and, and, it, and the MO was that they are thieves and robbers come to kill, steal, steal kill, and destroy. And then uh, it says, but then I came to, uh, to, to, to save them. And, and then you talked about how that relates to us. Well, it just hit me when you said that though, that the personification of that came later when Jesus was on the cross because the thief was right next to him, which his uh, uh, Emma was to steal. And he said, today you'd be with me in heaven. And then the people that were 
actively killing Christ and destroying his body, he said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So based upon, and when I never thought about this until just today, based upon, because Jesus, like you said, the most high, he has all authority uh, and no one can snatch something out of his hand, that maybe the people that actually killed Christ were saved on that day too. Because he said, he said, listen, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. So based on Jesus' request and him being, and in fact, God, are they forgiven? Could be, could, could those those people right there at the cross could have been, could have been forgiven just on Jesus' work. So I'm like, wow. If the mo the the method of um, the mo is to steal, kill, and destroy, and I came to save them, and then he personifies that on the cross as his final act. I'm like, wow. That's that's that was uh, that's what hit me, and I was I was like, okay. That's uh, that's crazy, but I love it. That's a, that's a great insight, brother. That's some real good insight right there. I appreciate that. Uh, it, it, what's so deep is that we can't judge. We don't we don't know what because he, he's still he's still on the throne. Jesus is the, is the one shepherd, right? And so we don't really know what what time it is in terms of judgment on <laughs> folks. Our that's not our job. Me and Jessica talk about that, like. My job isn't to judge, right? right? We don't we don't actually have that authority. Now, there will be that time where that authority is given where you can judge to a certain extent. You can judge whether or not the word is this or somebody's following the word or adhering to the word or telling the truth about the word and being Bereans and things of that nature. But in terms of whether or not a person is going to heaven or hell, we don't have that authority. We have no idea. So great point. And, and, and we all too, Right, our sins put Jesus on the cross, just like the people that were sitting sitting below the cross. Right, so we're really no different than them, and we don't know at what point because those people didn't die right there that second. So they could have gone on and repented right after he made that prayer. Lord, forgive them for the, for they know not what they do. They could have received a, a, a feeling of that blessing that Christ just prayed and changed their minds about, oh my God, look what I've done. Because there were some people who said he was the son of God and things of that nature. So we don't know. There's people who who Christ on the deathbed and you go, you can't, you not you can't cheat it. Right? I don't think you can cheat it. I don't think you can go, I'm just gonna be a terrible wretch. And then when I get on my deathbed, I'm gonna throw some prayer out there and say, if you exist, Lord, forgive me. Now, I, I think that God could come to you and really move you because we don't under, we don't know all the circumstances. Was there mental problems? You said they don't know what they do. Where they are, are that they, where there's so much trauma in their lives. The deception that was put on them was that heavy. We don't, we just don't know. So I, I appreciate you making that point. But we just don't know. Yeah, and the other the other piece of that is is that we don't know what what God's purpose is for each individual, you know? So, you know, his purpose for those people, you know, was he had to die on the cross. So he's like, so he could have been like, yeah, we're gonna purpose you to, to, to carry out my will because I'm laying down my own life. So you're actually doing the will, my will. So that's why maybe he's saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do because I'm, I'm willing them to do it because I have to I have to get this done. So now, you know, that's their purpose in this. Or the thief on the cross, his purpose was to fulfill the scripture. You know what I'm saying? To be there to fulfill the scripture so that he could forgive him so he can personify what he's already what he's already laid down in the word. So it's not like you said, it's not it's it, it's not really um up to us and we don't know the, the 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 purpose we don't know if if god saves someone on their deathbed it's been a horrible person all their life and then he saves them on the deathbed because they have a purpose to save someone who you know who may be there to witness the the, the last minute change or something we don't know he has purposes for different people and different tools and you know and, and that's what we have to we just have to focus on us that's right. Hey, the, 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 the short, quick and simple answer. One shepherd. 
<laughs> amen. Amen. Uh, well, first off, I just want to uh, say thanks, Rodney, for uh, doing this. I know I haven't been present. Uh, I've been on a different work schedule, so it's uh, easy for me to attend now. Uh, but I guess one of the underlying themes with um, what I've heard today is um, the idea of faith and faith, granted I'm paraphrasing obviously, but faith being in essence the way. Um, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe I misinterpreted this, but I guess one can, I guess, build their faith through the word of God or um but the word, and that's why I appreciate these uh, uh, these tutorials, because the word seems very, very ambiguous to me. And, um, you know, I like to get into these types of uh, discussions and, uh, you know, read books on certain things, but they actually break down these things because uh, it, it's all very ambiguous to me. And I've just throughout my adult life, I've had a very uh, challenging time with the idea of faith and how one builds faith. And I think you and I had this discussion several years ago. Uh, I can't recall what your response was, but I asked that very question. I said, how does one build faith? The key to building faith is experience. It's experiencing the word of God in action. It's gonna be harder to build faith by just only reading the word of God without actually the applying it that would be like reading the instructions on how to build a couch or a chair but not actually doing it and then when you build the chair according to the instructions you go oh voila the chair is built and there it is it's the same thing with the bible so jesus told them they were sweating him about the words that he was saying and so he's going okay if you can't go by just reading it, understanding what I'm saying or accepting it that way, then do it based on the works that I'm doing. So it's the same principle for us. If something is happening, the key is to find that what's happening in the Bible and then seeing what Jesus says about that versus just random. And then whatever the word says that's going to manifest based on that particular scenario see if that's what happens and then that's how you start to see that the word is living and active that is actually a person because john one is in the beginning was the word and the word was god and the word was with god and then the word became flesh so the words in the bible are actually a breathing entity a breathing person which is Jesus Christ living right now. So the question first and foremost is, I got to get to the point where I believe that he's actually living right now, that he's active and he does, you know, he's doing everything. He's, he's controlling the ship because it said one shepherd. So if, if it wasn't one shepherd, then he would have gone and there will be another shepherd, right? Some other kind of shepherd. But he's saying, no, there's only one shepherd, that's it. So he already said, and then you too will not perish. So he's saying he didn't die. So he's still the one shepherd. So as a result, everything in that word has to prove itself as itself because he's the prover, it's the person. So I read it and I go, okay, Jesus, you're saying that this is who you are. This is what you do. Then you start looking for it. Let me see if that's what happens. Let me see if that's how it goes down. Let me see if this is what's in place, positive or negative, because there's stuff in the Bible. He says, if you don't do this, you don't do this and you don't do this, this is what's going to happen. Are you talking about seeing if it really happens in your own personal life or based yes. on? Okay. It's got to be your personal life because if somebody else do it, if somebody else shows their lives and they're doing something, you didn't experience, you're not gonna know whether or not uh, it, it, it's 100% Jesus or not. Because then the intellect starts to kick in, right? You could be like, well, I don't, you know, that could be this or that could be that. So then you gotta test, you, you gotta have your own faith. So you go, okay, Lord. So the first thing you gotta go, oh, do I believe that God is real? And do I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God? And then you go, okay, Lord, 
I want to do this. There's a guy that prayed in the Bible one time. He says, I do believe, help me with my disbelief. So he was like, I, I, my disbelief is me being, well, I'm just shaky myself. There's something hindering me and I know that. So Jesus, help me with my disbelief. Help me to overcome this obstacle that's in my life that's holding my faith down. And now Jesus is say, okay, let me go working on you. Now the thing is, that's not just, you know, that's just not fun and games because now you open up the door to him doing whatever is necessary to show you that his word is word. And that could be, you know, the greatest high or the craziest low. <laughs> You might want to be a little bit specific, but but Lord, make sure it's something that I can handle. A little, you know, give me a little bit. You know, well, that that's kind of sort of my point, though. You know, so I'll use your example of the lowest of lows. You know, so you get in the lowest of lows, and and I only speak for myself, but I imagine this is indicative of some others. But in the lowest of lows, I imagine sometimes that's when folks' faith seems to wane the most because it's like. Why am I in the lowest of low right now? And and so I guess what I'm asking is how does one keep faith in those times? Because that's what I've struggled with over the years. Not that I have issue believing that God exists or that he is the father and in his son in his son Jesus Christ, but it kind of stops there sometimes. Um just something that really helped me was that um you know you have to like as Rodney was saying, you have to you have to be able to uh, apply it to your life and in different circumstances. I'll give you one small example. I remember one time I was working a job that was really stressing me out. Um, and I was, and I, I, I was, I remember having a prayer, I, uh, like at five o'clock in the morning I was getting ready to go into this job and I was like, God, you know, show me, show me what I need to be doing. I don't feel like this job is, is right for me, but the money's good. And, you know, and I'm in a management position and, you know, da, 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 da. And I'm going through all this stuff and I'm going back and forth and I don't know what the right answer is. I was like, God, show me, you know, and I begged him. And I literally walked into the job and we had a manager's meeting that morning at like 6.30. And they was like, hey, listen, we're going to cut everybody's pay by like, like 60%, you know, and, uh, or you can just leave, you know, or whatever. And I was like, Thanks, God. You know, just, you know, me, but, and I ended up leaving that job that day. But it was literally, I prayed at five and at 6 30, everything went, blew up. But, you know, it's, it's being able to, 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 to submit to what it is that you read. So the faith comes from hearing the word of God, the Bible says. So when you read the word of God and then you basically test God in that by praying and asking for, for that clarification whichever way it goes, as Rodney says. Sometimes it could be, you know, that will is you end up jobless, you know, which he ended up giving me a job that was paid more later on. But but the, but the thing about it was, is that, oh, you know, that may not have been the answer that I was looking for, but, but it was the answer that was God's will. Does that make sense? Yeah, it, it makes sense. Uh, thanks for that, Kevin. Um, and I guess um, my takeaway for what you just said would be one, having a clear understanding of the word of God, which has been an issue for me because the word as it's written has always been very ambiguous to me, which is why I appreciate times like this. Um, and then two, I guess maybe you just gotta be paying attention to what message is being given to you by God, which in all honesty, um, maybe I haven't necessarily been, you know, the best at paying attention to these things because I'm so caught up in the mix. And, and I don't necessarily, or maybe I'm not in the right frame of mind to, to hear or see the message uh, that he's given me. That's a possibility too, but I do know, I do make a, an asserted effort to try to understand what the word is saying. It's just, man, I'll read and, and the, the, the word and I just, man, I don't get it. I don't get it sometimes. What I do for myself is I write down how I'm thinking. And then I use that to measure it on what the word is saying. So, cause the word is saying, it's, it's the thought first before it was written. So it's God's thoughts, right? So 
whatever is happening in life, I got to go to kind of the basics. God created life. So that means life in and of itself has a rhyme and a rhythm all by itself. So how I think about a subject in life, he's already had the thought on that and he created that life. So his thoughts are there to correct, move me into the proper thinking, the correct thought. So if I don't write down how I'm thinking, like you said, it's confusing. I, I don't know if I'm hearing them. I don't know if I'm going I'm to write mine. And then you, and so that's the honesty that it takes. So you're actually doing what you're supposed to be doing, which is being honest with it. That's step one. And then two is a study that we just said where he says they didn't hear it because of this reason or they didn't get it because of that reason. And then you look at those and you measure those and you go, okay, so based on what God said about why I can't do that and what I'm saying about this is where I'm at, he's actually now giving me the answer. So that's how you start to talk to God through truth. And then you say, okay, then God must, if I'm, if I'm here and his word is here and there's a, there's a divide, then that word is going to have to tell me how to get my mind from there to here. And so you start reading further and then he'll tell you, right? I'm the gate, I'm the shepherd. You gotta let me lead you. The word's gonna take you there. And so now I'm looking for the answers. And then he'll say, if you do this, this, and this, and this, this is how you get there. But people don't read the Bible based on those basics. They're reading it like they would read an academic book. Guilty, guilty, you know, and it's, a, and I've historically done that. And um, uh, I would say only within the past six months have I really actually started to try to dig in and understand what it means. And I have gained some understanding, some better understanding of, of some things, but there's still, still tons and tons of ambiguity. Yeah. Yeah. So, hey, listen, we, we 20, 20 some years in and I'm still, learning like i just i've read that scripture a million times and today i was just like wow i just saw something and that's why the bible says as rodney said is if the word is living and active it's not meant to like okay i'm gonna read it cover to cover i understand it i i got all the information like an academic book and now i'm good i just put it down now you know like we did in school it's not that way it's and search out you know could be three sentences from there and that could be applying to exactly what you're going through um, you know, or something that you're going to go through. And then if you actively pray and uh, look for discernment, because God says he, he gives to those who seek him. So when you ask for discernment, God, show me what you meant by this. And then he'll, he'll, it, it's miraculous. Uh, I remember when I first became a Christian, it, it'll, you know, things will come up, pop, pop into my mind. It's like, remember, remember when you asked me three days ago about this thing, this is it right now. It's, it's happening in front of your eyes. You're like, whoa, I'm like, dang. I'm like, I forgot that I read that three days ago, but now it's happening. And now God, God will put the Holy Spirit will come and bring it back to your, to your consciousness. And you were like, yo, this is the personification of what I read a week ago. And then you're like, that builds your faith because now you're like, okay, that wasn't just a random scripture that I read. He was preparing. He, he knew already that this was going to happen a week ago. And now it's happening and I understand it. And that, that only makes you hungry to get more into the word because you want to know other stuff. When we read something academically, we usually can get it like it's not that big of a deal. There might be some stuff that's some quantum physics or whatever the case may be, but there's stuff out there that, you know, for the most part, you read something, you can get it. This is the words are not very tricky in the Bible. They're basic standard words, you know, as far as if you, if you read Hebrew, it's standard in Hebrew. This Greek is standard in Greek. We read it in English because we speak English. The actual vocabulary is very simple. Elementary school vocabulary, and yet is that difficult to understand. That already starts to tell me there is something here. So. In a, in, a, in a testing, when you test, like in science, right? When you test a hypothesis, you look at 
okay, well, what does it say in it? What is it? How does it describe itself? So the word is saying, Jesus is the word. And he says, I am in the father and the father is in me. So instead of reading a whole three chapters, let me take that one phrase and try to figure out what that one phrase is saying, because that's a heavy duty phrase, right? And so I go, okay, well, the, the sun, this is why I do it. The sun produces more energy in a day than the earth uses in a year. And the sun is tiny compared to another star, which is tiny compared to a beetle juice, which is tiny compared to other stars. And then there's galaxies, the Milky Way has gigantic is billions and billions of stars and there's billions of galaxies so this thing is so grand it's so big it's so crazy level incredible that man has only scratched the surface in recorded history of about six seven thousand years and yet the word says god created all that and held it in his hand how in the world, if that's true, because I got to ask myself in the hypothesis, I have to use the word if. If that's true, how am I going to know and master this book? Yeah, I was asking myself that very question. I can't. So the only way anybody can actually get anything in this book is it has to be given. It has to be given. So you have to be a receiver doesn't always mean that that means receiving from another person because the word is living and active. It's Jesus Christ in the flesh. So that means when I'm reading it, I actually have to set myself up to receive it from Jesus as I'm reading. So when I jump into it, I'm going, okay, God, give me a couple of things here to understand today. And then let me walk on those couple of things. And then you start to build like you had to do, you a gym guy, you know how to build muscle in that whole exercise game. You know you just can't run out there and I'm gonna go compete and miss the universe tomorrow. But people don't want that patience because we're really quick and we usually get stuff quick. And this is not a quick game. This is an eternal game. <laughs> uh, that, that, that puts it in perspective. It's just, you know, the same thing with the gym, same with anything, building up any muscle, be it here or here is consistency so i imagine this is no different no different no different this this is a real good breakdown just looking back through those um scriptures and um you know just the breakdown of the the gatekeeper you know which you know is god almighty and everything you know comes from that and then it was it was real interesting how it went from it started with the shepherd who most of us know and realize you know that 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 he's the, sh the the good shepherd, and how it it showed the parallel of the sheep to the shepherd, and it said, you know, they know my name, they know my uh, um, they know my voice, you know. Um, so I think that was a really good parallel. And then how it went a step further, and he went from the shepherd, and he's like, now I am the gate. So uh, you know, so for for, for a second, it's like a, a a mind thing. Like, wait, he's the gate. But then when you look and, you know, you, you talk about God's heart, you talk about how uh, the Jesus heart talking about how, you know, I am the way, the truth and the life. No one goes to the father, but by me, then that all starts to make sense. Like, oh, OK, yeah, he's the gate. That's how I get to God is going through the gate. And so um, it was just really good for that breakdown of going from the shepherd to the gate and you know just as the way that we get to the place we want to be and just through that just the, the comparison and the relationship between where we are and where jesus is and how we rely on him to get there but how he knows us and he loves us and he takes care of us so it, 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 was, it was really good breakdown. That that's a deep scripture. That passage is heavy duty, man. He he's I mean, he laying it out, especially after reading Revelation twenty two last week, and then reading Genesis before that, talking about the tree of life. 
And he kind of just binds that all together right in this particular passage and, and makes even more clarity to what we've studied before. And then as we study talking about the death concept and, and you shall not surely die and how that's an enemy. And then he just right here just said, well, you know, you're rolling with me, you just bypass that enemy. It's like, wow, you know, that's just heavy weight, man. It's just, it, it, then it's just coming down to, okay, whether I believe that or not, you know? Cause that's one of the things, sort of what Ramsey was talking about. Like when Ramsey said, when you're at your lowest low, right? Well, the lowest low is death. That's the lowest low. And if that can't even beat you, then there's nothing that can beat you. So then that means everything else is what let Ramsey just described as building muscle. God's gonna allow stuff to go down to see if you can lift that weight. Did you build that muscle? Right now, he start out by saying, I gave you everlasting life. You're a saved Christian. You have everlasting life. And now the, the greatest enemy, death, can't beat you. And nobody can snatch you out of my hand and nobody can snatch you out of my father's hand. So the one who created the whole universe, that's whose hand you're in. That's one powerful hand. So that means that everything else coming against me has to be exercised, <laughs> right? And I admit, I'm one of them cats that don't like a close game. I want a blowout, right? I don't want a nail biter. I want a blowout, right? Because I don't need the anxiety. So I want to beat you by 50 if it's a basketball game. I want to beat you by 50 if it's a football game. I want to beat you badly, right? So I can have fun and laugh and, and enjoy myself. But God is going, nah, you know you can't work out like that. You know you can't get in shape like that, just messing around if you're really trying to get in shape and compete. So he's going, I already gave you the victory over the greatest enemy, but that's the faith. Because you're not there yet, you're still living. So you're not even there yet where you're going to face the greatest enemy. Well then, if you know a big game is coming, don't you practice to the point where you could be good in the game? So it's the same thing. He's like, I got to get you trained up. So when you meet that enemy, you beaten him. I gave you what's necessary to beat him, but you actually got to win. I'm in you, but you have to win. So why? Your faith. So let's look at the example, because then Jesus has to give us, give us an example in that. He goes, I already knew what I was going to go through. He just said it in the, in the word we just read. I already knew what I was going to go through beforehand. And I had this authority before I got to this joint. And I had the authority to go through this process voluntarily and then win over it. And then yet in the Garden of Gethsemane, it was challenging enough for him to say, not as I will, but as you will. And he had to drop these, his, his sweat turned into blood. So he's showing us the victory over this last enemy is not an easy one. But so you got to get trained up. In the meantime, Jesus didn't go through it till he was 33. So he had to get trained up in the meantime. Now we can't take on the whole planet's sin. Right? That's not our job. But for whatever it is that he has purposed for us, he needs us to work out in the meantime. And now we have to work out our faith. In fact, the scripture says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. So he's telling you, this ain't no easy workout. So you start trying to study the word and stuff like that. Like, oh, I remember the first time I started looking at the Bible back in the day, I was like, oh man, this look like this. This stuff is written in a foreign language, man. This is, it's so deep, it's so big, it's so vast. This is, man, how am I ever gonna learn this thing? But now I'm 37 years in on studying the thing. And I, at one point I was studying 10 hours a day. So, it's not going to be as easy. Now, God might give it to somebody and they don't have to do the, the time I put in. 
and, and he can speed up their game past me. But I know that it wasn't some easy game. And so I don't even know any, I don't even have any friends that don't have the, the heart to win. I don't know nobody. None of you guys on this on this call right now that I've known every one of you, I've not known one of you to not have enough game to, to try to win at stuff. <laughs> None of you. So what would make the word any any different is is all is all that's what it is. You gotta work out. Yeah, that that's a great point. And with that, uh, keep in mind. The low of the lows is death. And none of us, none of us are experiencing the low of the lows because we're all here on the call. So it's not death. Is there's obstacles that come along our path that we have to fight through. And there's hardships that come along, you know, that 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 are really traumatic. They're, they're, they're really, they're really painful and they're wrenching. But some of it is keeping in perspective those things that God is bringing into our lives to build us so that, you know, um, you can continue on that path and continue to grow and continue to grow in faith, continue to grow in the knowledge that he is taking you from point A to point B to point C. You know, I, I guess, you know, I, I, got, I have a better understanding just based on this conversation right here. I guess if I put it in the context of working out, I mean, that is easy to understand for me. I just got to keep working out, basically. You know, I want to say thank you. It's amazing how this is aligning with uh, just where I'm at. Because you've seen the progression um, since we've been doing this since August. And when I stepped into this in August, um, it was because God showed me that I was struggling with uh, very, very heavy uh, self-hatred and just badgering myself for um, <laughs> being human, <laughs> being me, you know, and bad mistakes and not really accepting, you know, God's love and his correction. And um, although I profess to be a lover of Christ, I still somehow was punishing myself for uh my past and uh it's just been beautiful because right off the bat this morning you went all in for me when you shared psalms 82 verse 6 and uh that really touched me in an incredible way because i've been creating these i am statements where i can really just embrace who i am to god and so when when i read this and it said you are god's and you're all sons of the most high. You know, this really resonated in that that continuous stream of love that God offers us. And it elevated me to a place because as I went into this new year, the one thing that God had really impressed on me was that I needed to give myself permission. Like that he had already given me permission but that I needed to give myself permission to be the most amazing mom, to be happy and to pursue everything that he had for me. Um, and so I now have a permission list. <laughs> <laughs> I gave myself permission to go to Honolulu. <laughs> <laughs> I gave myself permission to enjoy it. And, um, and I gave myself permission to blow it too, you know? And believe it or not, that's just changed everything for me. So seeing this scripture this morning in Psalms and knowing that later in the word, God even says, like, wasn't it me who told you that you are God's? Wasn't it me that told you that you are sons of the most high? And it, so when you talked about how in all these different encounters throughout the word, that was Jesus, it just reminded me, you know, because he reminded us in the New Testament of those very things that it was him who said this, you know, back then. So, woo, that was amazing. And then, you know, for us to really dig into John chapter 10, the way that we did today, um, one of my huge prayers lately, choose God over anything else, you know, 
the success and all the things that we strive for in life, you know, and, you know, considering that I'm striving to get to heaven. And as we read through John 10, I was like, yeah, you know, the, the best use of my time is really to figure out how to help others, you know, get this. And so I'm so grateful that you um, see your best use of your time, Rodney, and that you take the time to share this with us because, you know, heaven is inevitable. Like we're striving for that. And then John 10, when you talked about life to the full, and then you went on and you started talking about faith beyond death, you know, life is beyond death. And I'm just so grateful for all these things because, you know, he knows us right and then the question then is you know how do we get to know him because even moses didn't want to do anything unless god preceded him he's like yeah yeah no it's okay i i won't go unless you go i need your presence that i would be able to walk in that so this just really stimulated everything um in that direction but i do know that everything works out for the good you know And, you know, that's the biggest thing is that even though we're going through difficult times, you know, just constantly looking for God's good in it, you know, looking for what it is that God is trying to show me, what it is that he's trying to teach me. Um, Yeah, trying to find that book of life, my page in it and stay on my page in my lane. (laughs) Amen. Amen. Uh, You said some real good stuff. And um, I think the simplicity of this word is that scripture that says you are not your own and i think that the understanding of you are not your own is we came from adam and eve we came from god and that people understand jesus is the example right people say jesus is my example but then they limit what that means. They say, Jesus is my example that I cannot do. Then how is he your example? How, how is Jesus your example if you can't do it? They go, because Jesus was perfect and I can't be perfect. And, and guess what? <laughs> then that's not where he's your example. He's your, if he's your example, he's your example in what you can do. He's not your example in what you cannot do, right? That's when he's the father. So he says, me and the father and you guys in me. So he's going, because you can't do, you can't, you can't, the, the father's example, you guys can't handle that. He can handle that. That's why he's the mediator between us. He said, he can handle that. And then at the same time, deal with us. So he's going, where where my example is, I had to, I'm showing you guys based on you fail. But if we think we're our, our own, we want the word, God, the spirit, everything to wrap around us the individual God's like that's not the book that's not the book you're reading that's the book you think you're reading but that's not what the book is you are not your own is you come from Adam and Eve your descendants your descendancy brought on DNA tainted by sin So what I'm describing is based on them. (laughs) Everything that he's describing is based on man fallen, man fallen forgiven. That's why he says, I have no respect of persons. Now, the fact that he knows our name, that's incredible. Because other than that, you are man and woman. That's it. Even his mama, when she came to him about the party, he said, woman, what do I got? He called her a woman, (laughs) all right? So for him, you man and you woman. For him, you are fallen. 
Now, I've come to be your example of what faith will do for you because you cannot follow me where I go based on perfection because you can't get through the gate. Your sin is gonna prevent you from getting through the gate. I can go through the gate. Jesus go through the gate, he turned around. We all on the other side. We can't get in. So he can't be our example in that. But if people don't understand the program, what the Bible is really saying from the start, then they're judging the book and everything about it based on their individual self. You don't, your individual self is part of a whole collaborative concept. So it says in Adam, and we studied Adam one and Adam two already. In Adam one, you all die. In Adam two, you shall all be made alive, right? That's the program. So you go, well, how does Adam two make us all alive? He, I had this discussion with a guy, a minister. It had to be close to 20 years ago. And he, it shook him because he wasn't really accepting it. And I said, Jesus didn't go to heaven because he was perfect. Oh man, that shook him. What do you, what do you mean Jesus didn't go to heaven because he was perfect? I said, he didn't go to heaven because he was perfect. I said, he, he, he resurrected and went back to heaven because of his faith. He died for us because he was perfect. His perfection allowed him to overcome the law, defeat the law, the law that held us in prison, as it says in the New Testament. So because of that, because of his perfection, he's the unblemished, unspotted lamb. And that allowed him to be the sacrifice that Satan could not condemn. The rest of us got a blemish, a spot that Satan could point to. But Jesus did not have one where he took on all of our sin except instead of it being annually and being an animal, it was one time being a man. And as a result, he took all of that to the grave. Now he has the power to resurrect. So he believed in his ability to resurrect after taking on all of our sin and being separated from God because sin separates us from God. There it is our example. And then he resurrects and ascends. So he's telling you guys, do you see now? You're God with the little G and an S. This, I did it for you. Now, this is how you roll. That death, if you do it this way, that death no longer has supremacy over you. You will now live for eternity. You now have the tree of life I just showed you. So it's not just saying it, he actually showed us. And so then he says to us, as because we say, well, then that means, Lord, we, if we're going to be credited with righteousness and therefore be deemed sinless, blessed is the man whose sin is not counted against him, now why am I still catching all the drama? He says, because you're still in the flesh. And that's the part that has to go not the inner you, not the spiritual you, not the inner being. That's the part that lives forever. So you know, I'm on a time limit. Mm -hmm. So if you don't start living your life, like you're on no time limit, if you still believe you have to accomplish this, your greatest things in this earth, in the flesh, you're going to struggle. If that's what you believe, you're going to be running out of time because you believe in time where time doesn't relate to you. Since you still believing in this lower level that I have raised you up from, you're going to struggle here based on that. And he says, in this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So he's given us rules and concepts and realities that we have to say, okay, I'm gonna think the way he's saying, and that means I can't be defeated. I, there's nothing that can beat me. That is so prolific and so timely for me right now, because you know the enemy tries to mess me up with my emotion. 
you know, oh, you know, I really need somebody to talk to or, you know, they weren't really being my friend or just, you know, stupid girl stuff, whatever. You guys may not even understand or relate to that. But what God has been showing me is like he is all that for me. He, I don't even need any of that when I've got him. And, and just being able to just morph into a woman that says, man, God, you're everything for me. There is nothing that I need besides you. And, you know, money, you are my provider, you know, whatever, like just really playing with that because it started to get kind of funny because the distress that comes from whatever it is that we think we need, I need more time. Yesterday, the funniest thing happened because, you know, I, somebody gave Miles an assignment. Miles is my son and he's supposed to preach yesterday for Devo. Well, they told him he was gonna preach on, maybe it was Wednesday when we got back from Hawaii. We got back on Thursday, but on Wednesday, he got noticed that he was gonna preach last night. They didn't tell him he was supposed to find the place. So at, you know, 10 o'clock in the morning, they're like, okay, so where are we having Devo? And I was like, Miles, when did they tell you you were? Well, you know, obviously he didn't know this. And at one o'clock, they're calling him, asking him, okay, so where's this? Where's the spot? Where are we? And I thought, you know what, God, this is okay. I'm going to need you real quick. So we prayed and I picked up the phone. And I kid you not, at 1.30, we were having Devo at the San Gabriel Airport. How did that happen? Who even knew we could use the San Gabriel Airport? But one of the brothers told Miles to contact Salvador. Contact Sal, maybe he has a suggestion. So he reached out to Sal. Sal was like, oh, we need to do it, you know, do it in the park. But it was too cold to really do it in the park. It's gotten cold. So guess what the name of the manager of the San Gabriel Airport is? Yep, Sal, Salvador. Wait, I don't think they know what Salvador means because nobody laughed. It's okay. It was it the name savior. of the man. Huh? He <laughs> meant savior, you guys. Yes. <laughs> well, I didn't know it meant savior, so thank you for giving me the heads up. It's... <laughs> Amen. But we did. We we did contact Sal. You guys know Sal Velasco. But then the name of the guy at the airport, he so he really saved in man, they haven't stopped saying how amazing the place was. But I was thinking about how this angel in in the present moment, like our angel in that presence, and he saves us. It's his love and his compassion, but it's like he carries us, you know, and like you were saying, it becomes timeless because time wasn't in, in my mind, in my human mind. Oh my gosh, how are we gonna do this? You know, it's one o'clock there, you know, but you know, by two o'clock it was all locked down. They all were able to get there on time and do what they needed to do. But anyway, I hear you, bro. What you're saying is so on time for me. And I just really appreciate this. Thank you. And thank you, Jessica, for hearing. <laughs> amen, amen. Father God, God, thank you so much for this time that uh, we've all had to spend together in your word and just uncovering layer by layer, God, um, the things that you have for us. God, your word is so deep. You are so deep. Your son Christ is so deep that uh, we cannot possibly begin to fathom, pray that we can just develop our muscles uh, to be able to uh, work out on a continual basis. God bless uh, Rodney for putting this uh, the study together and for and for having the heart to share with us, God, for inspiring us. God bless uh, everyone on the call, God. Um, I, I pray especially for Ramsey that he can that you can continue to give him discernment and to uncover uh, the beautiful truths of your word for him to inspire him to continue to work out to continue to grow it's nothing like when you see that when you start to see those results uh, it just makes you want to work out harder so god uh, i pray that you show him results that will just give him make him hungrier 
and be able to, uh, you know, to, to, to be able to, to, to guide him in, in the direction that, that, that you have for him, God. I pray for um, uh, Stephanie, God, that you would just uh, be with her to uh, to show you to show her that uh, that she is worthy of your love, that she, and that you know as your word says, how can you love uh, God if you don't love uh, you know the person? So that means that applies to self love too, God. You know we got to be able to love ourselves uh, in our imperfections because we are made perfect in your word, God. Lord, I just pray that uh, each and every one of us go out and have a great day today, um, that, that you grant us health, you grant us peace, you grant us, um, um, you know, guidance. And in those things, I pray in your son Jesus' name. Amen. And to the amen. Thank you, Brother K. Rob. Greatly appreciate it. Yeah, and everybody man. on this call, phenomenal time, man. Uh, it's just a great thing. And as always, as we say, Trevi Trev, peace in. Peace in. That's right. All hey, right. Uh, two two things I got to say before I leave real quick. Uh, Rodney, you said everyone on this uh, call has a heart to win. Uh, I would say with the exception of Trevor being a Raiders fan, he does not have the heart to win in football. Wow. That's the first, that's the first thing. He's a winner in, in every other area of life, but in football, He's, he's lacking that. Wow. Uh, the second From thing, the person whose team didn't even make the playoffs. Okay. The second thing I have to say is Ramsey sounds like Barack Obama when he talks. That's all. <laughs> <I'm thinking about. laughs> that's, that's not the first time I've heard that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> now, now you guys will not be able to unhear that. Every time you talk, you hear Barack. <laughs> and you know what? I've been knowing him for years, bro, for a decade, and I never really thought about it. But as soon as you said it, and then it, 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 he do sound like him. Amen. Amen. Hey, good <laughs> stuff, man. I'm glad to be a part of this uh, this morning. You guys, God bless everybody here. Brother, God bless you, brother. God bless you, brother. Y'all people. Yeah, Jesse, thanks, for that, thanks for that Salvador uh, lesson, Jess. Oh, cool. No, all I want to say is that I'm so happy we're studying the Bible together. And that, um, that's how we grow. That's how we we can help each other. Whoever is going through different challenges, um, it may help the other person that that is just listening. But um, I'm so happy to see you all and be able to share the word with you guys. And um, yeah, I just love you all. <laughs> Amen to the amen. Peace in, everybody.